we will uh, get started in a moment. We are waiting for our guests to arrive who may be a minute or two late. But while we wait for that, um, anybody who's on, and I know last time we've had trouble, people get on sort of slowly because of the way the webinar works, but we have a couple poll questions. Um, and anybody can fill this out. Does, you, students, anybody else who might happen to be watching, feel free. Um, so Mike, can you pop the questions up there? So yeah, fill out these. You've got, um, we'll do this for about a minute. Shouldn't take you very long. All right, let's go ahead and uh, well, we'll give you give you 10 more seconds. We'll cut that off. So vote. And if you don't vote, it's OK. Um, so uh, all right, let's let's go ahead and end that. And Mike, you're in control of this, I think. Uh, so you want to share the results? Um, all right, half of you think that the polls are undercounting Trump. And half of you think they're probably accurate. None of you think that the polls are overcounting Trump voters. Um, and it looks like more of you than not believe that networks should wait until the polls close in each state before projecting the winners, which is what they do now. There are some places like in France where law prevents them from projecting any winners until the actual votes are count. And then they hand a ballot like the Academy Awards and they announce it all at once. We will talk to Ken Goldstein about this because he's one of the people who makes those projections. I'm sure he has strong views. Um, let's go ahead and flash up the uh, second set of, uh, we have two more questions for you. Different types of questions, I'd say. And Ken, welcome. Um, we are just in the middle of, uh, of uh, asking a second set of questions, which I don't know if you, can you see those questions, Ken? I don't they know just, if they- They just uh, popped up, but I, but I hide all my feelings very closely, so I can't even tell you that. Yeah, these are not feelings. This is market research, which I only ask these questions because I've heard you talk about these things before which are kind of fascinating. It's, uh, it's, and, and the students students love more than anything the uh, which alcohol different partisans drink. Um, okay, you know what, Mike, I'm gonna have you don't share the results. Why don't you just tell us, uh, why don't you just tell us what, um, what, what the answers are, Mike? What did students say? So according to market research, who drinks more expensive beer? We've got 67% for Democratic voters and 33% for Republican voters. Okay, and we'll get to that. That if I, it used to be when Ken told me before about this, that would be wrong, but um, I'm not sure if that's still the case. And then what about the second question? What type of vehicle, according to market researchers, best indicates that the owner is likely Democrat voter? We have 0% for convertible, 0% for pickup truck, 44% for minivan and 56% for hybrid. That would be correct, which uh, again, we will get to, uh, cool. or as I know. So, so let, let me go ahead and introduce Ken here because our guest today is uh, Ken Goldstein, who is one of the nation's preeminent experts on polling, political polling, uh, advertising. Um, he wears many hats. He was a co-founder of the Big Ten Battleground Poll which are the states in the Midwest that determine the president, unlike California, where polling is uh, less important for the presidential race. Former president of Cantor Media, which is a uh, firm that looks and tracks political advertising and advises candidates on it. And they might find out whether or not uh, beer is drinking by, which kind of beer is drank by which party. Uh, he's the director of the University of San Francisco program in Washington, which back when we used to welcome students into our building was housed in the UCDC building. He uh, is also part of the ABC election night team, which is the team that tells you once the polls have closed, uh, for example, in California, roughly a millisecond after the polls close, they'll say 
ABC News now projects that California will go for Joe Biden. But in other places like Florida is a lot more complicated. Um, as usual, we will, I'm gonna start off by asking some questions and then you guys jump in with questions, type them into the chat room. We will call on you, we'll have you show your face then hopefully to ask the questions. If for some reason you wanna do it anonymously, just say anonymous and we'll read the question. Um, and let me start out with the question and Ken, Ken uh, has a uh, slideshow which he presents a uh, presentation, uh, which he's gonna, and it may be that you wanna get to it in answering this first question, which is sort of the obvious broad question. Um, but, so the question is, uh, the, the first set of questions we ask students is what they think about polls, will they be accurate? And most people thought either that they undervalue Trump voters or they have no idea, or, or, or the polls are accurate. The polls obviously blew it in terms of the state turnout four years ago. What has happened since then? And should people feel comfortable that pollsters know what they're doing in 2020 more than they did in 2016? Yeah, and uh, so uh, you know, uh, thank you, Mark, for having me here. And, 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 uh, and, and thanks to be here. I wish we were uh, all here on a Monday night at the UCDC building with uh, all of you eating pizza and, uh, and, and, and listening to us talk. And I hope you'll, uh, I hope you'll be able to come, uh, come be with us in DC at some point in the, uh, in the near future. And I'm sure as, um, as Mark and Helen and others have, have, have told you, uh, you may not have gotten to do it this semester, but you're, uh, you'll be sort of in that UCDC uh, family of alumni and, uh, and, and, and always happy to talk with people when they make their, when they make their way out here. Uh, so, um, you know, as Mark, as Mark said, there was a divide in the performance of, of polls. Um, and in 2016, I might even be more negative on the polls than many people were, which is actually saying something. Um, but the, the national polls um, had Hillary, Hillary Clinton winning by four or five percentage points in the national popular vote. As all of you know, she ended up winning the national popular vote by about 2%, but of course that did not translate into states to give her a victory in the, uh, in the, uh, in the electoral college. Um, so first of all, there's some that claim that, you know, the national polls actually weren't that bad. They were within two or three percentage points of that national popular, of that popular vote. Um, I'm actually a little bit more, more, more grouchy about that because they were all off in the same direction. So if it was the case that half the polls were underestimating Hillary Clinton's vote or some of them had Donald Trump winning and then the other, you know, the other half were actually a Hillary Clinton winning by more, um, I would be more confident that there was not a systematic bias in the national polls. But the fact of the matter that all of the polls, basically all of the high quality polls, all of the national polls released in that last week had Hillary Clinton at that four or five percentage point, uh, point victory. And if I'm grumpy about the national polls, even more so when it comes to the state polls, as Mark said. Um, and there were really two things going on. One, there simply was not a lot of polling in states like uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And by the way, when you talk about the Clinton campaign, even the Clinton campaign wasn't polling in those, in those states during the last week or two, uh, week or two of the campaign. So one, you didn't have a lot of polls. And with some exceptions, the polls in those states were not of high quality. And one major thing that they missed is, um, and uh, sorry, I don't have you in my campaigns and elections class because I bore people on the subject of waiting for a long time, but the importance of getting the demographics of your poll correct. And many of these polls in the Midwest that got it very wrong did not properly weight the electorate severely underestimating the number of white voters without a college education, uh, which still make up a significant chunk of the electorate nationally, 42, 43% of, uh, of American voters, and an outsized share of the vote in upper battleground of Midwest states. And that is also the group in the electorate that is the most loyal to then, can that was the most loyal to then candidate Trump and remains the most loyal to uh, to uh, to now president. You're saying Trump. they showed up unexpectedly, so pollsters didn't expect them to vote in big numbers, and they defied history and they voted more than they had in the past. Well, it was sort of two things. It was both. One, even if they would have voted the way they always did, they didn't have enough of them in their polls because they rated to race and education, but didn't rate weight 
to the combination of race and education. So even if turnout would have been what they thought it was gonna be, they didn't get it right. Plus then there was, um, there was, uh, well, there was higher turnout among that group. So in states like Michigan, for instance, non-college educated whites had an increase in turnout, whereas um, people of color, mostly, mostly black people, mostly black voters in Detroit had a decrease in their voter turnout. So, um, so, so, I mean, I know you are, you are fiercely nonpartisan. Your, your Cantor group uh, for uh, eight years ago advised both the Obama and the Romney campaign on advertising. Um, but in the university bubble, and certainly the bubble I live in, um, I know many people who have nightmares reading the polls, saying that, that Biden is comfortably ahead and not believing any of it because they don't think that the pollsters have adjusted. Um, do you think pollsters have adjusted? Do you think that Biden has the kind of lead that polls suggest he does? Yeah, then, uh, it's funny you say that. My, my wife says when I do these presentations, it's um, about 5% social science and mostly 95% counseling for people before the... Um, yes. Uh, before the uh, before the election, um, so um, most there, there are more polls in these battleground states. So go look at Wisconsin. I think there's probably been 15 polls, 15 publicly released polls in Wisconsin just in the last two or three weeks. Most of them, but not all of them, are using higher quality higher quality um, methods. So that gives me a little bit of confidence, a little bit more confidence in, um, in, in the numbers. The other thing that gives me a little bit more confidence is the stability that we've seen in the polling. And if you look at the national numbers, on average, Joe Biden's winning eight, nine, 10 percentage points. There've been a couple, couple polls that were sort of on the high end of that, high end of that recently. That's been the case since March. And if we sat here, all of us pretty smart people, and tried to name everything that's happened in the last seven or eight months that was a game changer. We could, we would, we would miss stuff, right? So even with all the things that have happened over the last seven or eight months, that race has stayed consistent. The number of undecideds is much less than it was in 2016. And that's also a good segue to talk about something that happened in a state like Wisconsin. So, uh, uh, I'm biased. He's a good friend of mine, Charles Franklin, who's my former colleague at the University of Wisconsin, who does the Marquette University poll. Um, Charles is a very smart guy, very high quality poll. His poll was even off. Um, but he did his last poll, I think, nine or 10 days before the election. He had a large number of undecided. And you usually think yeah, one of three things is going to happen with undecided. One, they're not going to vote. It's also sort of, you know, amusing when you think about it. Can you imagine being undecided now? I just need to learn a little bit more about what's going on in politics before I can make a decision, right? So one assumption is if, if they haven't decided, they're not gonna vote. The other assumption is maybe they vote for a third party. But then the third assumption is if they vote and they don't for a third, vote, vote for a third party, they'll split their votes evenly. But what happened in 2016, which will then get me into another point, the, uh, the late breakers broke overwhelmingly for candidate Trump. And the thing about those late breakers and their characteristics, which is a bit different than now, those late breakers disliked both candidates. So one in five voters in the last presidential election disliked both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Okay. And again, you usually think if you dislike both, you don't vote or you break evenly. The haters, right? I call it, you know, the lovers and the haters, right? The haters who disliked both candidates broke overwhelmingly for Donald Trump. In this election, you have fewer undecideds. So there's less, not only do you have fewer undecideds and then and, and you have more people who say they're certain who they're gonna vote for, you have more people who've actually voted, right? I mean, you think as of today, you probably had 25 or 30 million people who've already voted in this country. Right. Joe Biden's favorability number is above water. Joe Biden is plus 10 in fave. Hillary Clinton was minus 10, minus 11, minus 12, minus 15 in her, in her, in her favorability. So those are some things that make it, make it different. Now, people talk about you know, shy Trump voters. Um, 
I always find it a little bit amusing to use the word shy and Trump in the same, in the same sentence, right? Um, I think it's not so much that there's, that there's people who plan on voting for President Trump who are lying to survey researchers and saying they're gonna vote for Biden and they're really gonna vote for Trump. I think it's more the case that um, uh, 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 Republicans who are not particularly enthusiastic about Donald Trump or, or pessimistic about their party's chances aren't really in a great mood to talk about politics or answer polls now. Uh, and so you get this differential non-response, which is probably more the case than people actually lying to pollsters. Is that the case? You're getting different. So Republicans are less likely to respond to polls than Democrats? Yeah, so one of the classic examples of this is, uh, um, well, you remember it, Mark, some of our students may not, but the 2012 presidential election, Romney and Obama, um, Obama was up going into the first debate and a lesson to all the students, always do, your, always do your homework and prepare for class because President Obama didn't really prepare very well for the first debate. Mitt Romney did very well in the first debate. That race tightened, but it tightened more, I mean, but it, it seemed to tighten more than it actually did because what happened was, as we circle back to all the uh, stressed out academic bubble, uh, bubble Democrats, Democrats got nervous after Barack Obama's performance in the first debate and then didn't want to talk about politics for a week, didn't want to answer their polls. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example and this will probably bring up some trauma for Mark and I know I use too many sports analogies but it's actually apt here. Not Michigan um, football, please. Yeah, so this is the, this is the you know, uh, five year anniversary of uh, uh, Michigan losing in the very last second on this heartbreaker to, uh, to Michigan State. Um, how many stories about Michigan football did you read the week after that game? You probably just went into your room and clutched your pillow and turned off the lights. Um, so, and, and then if they would have won, you would have, you would have devoured, you would have consumed lots of information. Um, uh, you know, again, I use too many sports analogies, but it is, it is apt here. When things are going well for your partisan team, you wanna consume lots of information. You're happy to do a survey. You're happy to talk to me as a pollster when things aren't going well for your team, then you just want it to be over. You don't want to talk about what's going on. So um, talk for a minute about what it's like for you on election night. I mean, it's, is it fair to describe that between you, well, how you make your calls on election night and how it gets from your brain to George Stephanopoulos's lips saying, we now have a call, ABC News projects that Florida will go for whoever. So um, uh, respecting my, uh, my, my powerful ABC and Disney NDA and not telling you any secret, big, big secrets. Um, but I'm, I'm, one of, uh, I'm one of a couple of people at ABC who help run the, de help run the decision desk. Um, and um, we, um, we use a variety of, of, of data. Everyone talks about exit polls, but the truth is very few states, except for the obvious states are called just off exit polls or just off off polling. Um, and then there's precinct level models that we look at, and then also county level models we look at. And eventually, if a state's really close, you're just sort of looking at the vote as it comes in and trying to figure out what is, uh, what is left that is out there. Um, the big challenge, and it's no big, it's no big secret for everybody this year, and for us this year, because there's this huge divide in how people are going to cast their ballots. Democrats, much more likely to cast their ballots early and by mail. Republicans, much more likely to cast their ballots on election day. That varies by state. It also varies by state how they report, how they report that, those results and when they report those results. So the big challenge for me and my colleagues at ABC, along with our other less good networks, I hope everyone saw a big smile on my face when I say that, but they're, they're also good people at those other networks. Um, uh, uh, is to be figuring out how much of the vote actually was early, how much of the vote actually was on election day. On those states, California is not competitive in the presidential race, but I think California finally just finished counting its vote in, in some of those Orange County 2018 congressional races. If you remember those, it took three or four weeks for us to know the winner in those. Um, some states, um, 
Absentee or early ballots have to arrive on election day, by election day, and they're counted. Other states, like California, they only have to be postmarked by election day. So if the race is really close, we may not know the, the complete size of the early vote, and we may not know the complete direction of the early vote. So um, if you're not, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, that, that, that's so it. So if, if, uh, if you're not using exit polls, which surprises me, is, is sort of the main source of it, you're looking then at turnout, so that if turnout were heavy in the Central Valley of California, if there happened to be a tight race, you would say, okay, that's gonna be a more conservative outcome. And if turnout was heavy in the Bay Area in LA, you would say, it's easier for you to project a winner on the, for the Democrats. Yeah, so like if you know if anyone had take, take uh, you know had taken my class, they would have heard one thing over and over. And I just I actually I actually see here that my my former colleague and my very good friend Andrea Wise, who was at USF before Berkeley stole her away, has probably heard me say this fifty times in presentations. Um, at the end of the day, understanding elections is about share and performance, and trying to influence elections is about share and performance and good polling is about share and performance. What do I mean by that? What size, what's the size of the electorate in particular areas among particular um, ethnic groups, racial groups, education groups, partisan groups. So how big their size is and then how they're performing, who they're voting for. So at the end of the day, you can make it very complicated and it is very complicated what we're doing on, uh, on, on election day calling races but we're just trying to figure out what the size of different areas of Ohio is and how each is performing. So and I'll ask a couple more questions and I'm gonna turn it over to the students. Um, so when I'm flipping the channels manically on election night, cause I'm sure a lot oh, of people don't, do. Don't, don't flip, ABC. Just well, ABC. No um, um, ABC is not always first. It may be the most accurate, but this actually gets to what I wanted to ask. Typically what you'll see is somebody, often Fox, will jump out, and I've talked to you before, you say it's not necessarily responsible, they'll jump out and they will make a projection. And lo and behold, within six minutes, if not 30 seconds, every other network has declared. And I sort of picture your, your producer screaming into your room, come on, Fox and NBC have uh, projected, can't we project this? I mean, how, how does that work? Because you're working on a split second timetable. So, no screaming. Everyone at ABC is very nice and 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 and, and calm. Um, listen, there it, it is. A, it, it's news networks, and it's a competitive and it's a competitive business. Um, and I'm not just saying this, but um, before every election, the president of ABC meets with us, and the direction is very much be accurate, be right, and the speed is not as important. Um, I think we. Uh, we're not only we're, we're not always first. I think we're rarely third or last, um, and um, uh, and I think it varies by race and it varies by state and it varies and it varies by um, by year. But listen, if I'm getting rewarded, I get you know two extra M and M's if I'm first. I get a billion extra M and M's if I'm not wrong. I mean, it's really that's the that's how much the, the attention is on, 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 uh, on, uh, on, on getting it right. We're actually, it's, it's funny, oh man. They used to call it the quarantine room where we all were for the decision team. But then since we're now in a pandemic that was freaking everybody out at ABC News when they had this sign that said the quarantine room. So now they call it the embargo room um, where, we, where we sit. Um, we don't know what other folks are doing, right? We're, we're sitting there, we're sitting there um, working the problem. Um, not commenting about any of my other network colleagues. Um, the challenge for this and people evaluating the work afterwards is, um, I mean, the example I always give is um, um, my wife's first job out of college was as a local television reporter down in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and, uh, and she was working there during the 1992 presidential race and I went down to visit her and uh, after the election. And, the networks, I wasn't yet the person calling races, but the networks called Bill Clinton the winner at poll closing time, very early in Georgia in 1992. And so I go down there and all the folks at Amanda's TV station are going, oh, wow, you're like, you New York people must have been really smart to call it. No, that was a mistake. Bill Clinton ended up winning the race by a razor thin margin. So we ended up gutting it out, right? So sometimes 
you can be wrong to have made the call at the time, but if it ends up working out, and when I say someone's being, listen, I would define someone being reckless if they're calling a race with less than a 97% chance of it being right, okay? We only call races when we have a 99% chance of it being right. And rarely are people calling races when it's a 50 or 60% chance of being it right, of it being right. So even if you make what I would consider to be a bad call at the time, no one will know about it because it's most likely you'll end up skating that out. So, and again, if you've got questions, type them into the chat while we'll calling you shortly, uh, right after this question. Um, so you've been doing this, not to make you feel old, a long time, so long that according to the first election, it says you work for the networks. That was when California was voting Republican. That's how long ago it was, which would have been uh, George H.W. Bush in 1988, uh, when you first were involved with the networks. So the world is completely different. And, you know, that, um, I mean, and you've got, uh, you, you've got kids who don't watch network television. So all your research on advertising has to have changed. You have people who have cell phones, which nobody had in 88. I mean, how is it that you adjust for, not just in polling, but in market research, you know, the fact that people don't watch TV commercials now, people don't respond to the cues that they did when you were the age of our students. Yeah, it's always funny. I'll always ask my students to name one network anchor. And I wonder if any of the students, you know, here could even name one network anchor, just simply not how you, how you. Type uh, it into the chat room. We'll see, but go ahead. Yeah. If you can name one network anchor, um, see if you can, uh, see if you, see if you get that. So, I mean, there's a couple, there's a couple of questions there. It's both how you reach, especially younger people when, you know, just to point out to our students, they, they realize that this actually is a phone too that you can talk on as well, right? Um, not just, you know, not just for everything, everything else. So it's very difficult to reach younger people with, um, with, uh, with telephone surveys. Um, there, has, uh, there has definitely been a move and they vary in quality, many more online surveys, both probability and, um, and, non, uh, and non-probability. Uh, and then in terms of uh, touching voters, trying to reach voters, the old world of uh, just buying local news, which is what all the old people who voted watched, um, that's still done. There's still gonna be billions and billions of dollars spent on local television and local television and local television news. Um, but this is the election where we're finally seeing digital mature in terms of the proportion of the spend it's getting. So overall in the presidential race, um, uh, and President Trump and the Republicans actually spend more on digital than the Democrats, you'll probably have 35 or 40% of the advertising spending on, uh, on, uh, on, on digital in some of the lower ballot races, it will be more than that. But just to give you an example, that number was probably only 10% the last election, maybe 5% the previous election. Um, and in commercial advertising, right, for beer, cars, paper towels, all that other stuff, the proportion of digital to TV probably went over 50% digital over 10 years ago. So politics has been slow to the game of focusing on, on digital. The one thing where there is some, um, where some young people watch, and it's still very valuable TV real estate, is, um, is sports on television um, because uh, it's something that people also don't DVR. You don't record it, you watch it live and you watch the commercials. And if you wanna watch particular games, the NBA playoffs, the World Series, college football, the NFL, really the only place to watch it with, with a few exceptions is on a regular old television. Okay, let me, um, so uh, a couple of questions have popped up. The first one wants to remain anonymous. Uh, uh, so I'll read it to you. When we see poll results being discussed in the media, how can we discern whether polls have representative, accurate demographic respondents? Whoever did that should not have made that an anonymous question because this is a super question. Um, I, so I always go and try and find the demographics of the poll. Uh, and shockingly, even many of the national high quality polls, remember how I said share in performance? You can't find the 
gender breakdown, the age breakdown, the education breakdown, the racial breakdown, the party ID breakdown, and then the cross tabs on, on how each of those groups are, are, um, are, uh, are, are, are going. So the sad answer is sometimes you can't, and if you can't, you should be very wary of the numbers, but it's the first thing I do when I, when I, when I see a poll come out, which is to go and try and see if they reported those demographics. Uh, okay, um, Chantal, who, as you know, is not a student here, but one of our program administrators. Uh, you wanna ask a question? We can uh, bring Chantal up to the magic screen here. There she is. Hi, Ken. Thank you so much for doing this. This is so super interesting. My pleasure. Um, so my question is, what are the chances that there will be a call made on election night, given the high amount of people who have done early voting? And if there is a delay, how many days do you predict it will take? And do you predict courts may have to become involved in some, some of the states? No pressure. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Um, I mean, those, those are, uh, those really are great questions. Um, so I don't know, of course, is the answer. It depends on, it depends on the margin. I think it's important that people have the right, correct, and I'm not sure what that level is, of, of knowledge and apprehension about what's gonna happen on election night. I think you know, folks getting too nervous, we're not gonna know for three or four weeks and the courts are definitely gonna get involved, um, could have the effect of, uh, amping up the drama and actually decreasing people's um, likelihood of voting. On the other hand, um, and, I, and, I, and I think people are aware of this and the news media has done a good job of communicating how much of the vote is early and how much of the vote is on election day and what we may or may not know on election night. Um, but it's really gonna come down to um, to the margin nationally in the margin particular state. So for example, Florida, which um, uh, you know, the positive thing about Florida is it's a state where people have always voted early in absentee. Uh, we used to get 55% of the vote early, we'll probably be higher than that. But the states, the counties, the election officials are, are, used, to, are used to processing and counting early vote and they release all that vote that night at poll closing time. So the polls close in Florida at 7 p.m. and all those counties then dump all their absentee ballot, release all their absentee ballot results right then. Uh, and, then we're, and then we'll get the election day vote as the night, as the night goes on. So if it's a three or four or five percentage point race or even a two percentage point race for one of the candidates, Florida could get called election night, and that will tell us a lot, especially if Joe Biden wins Florida. Thing about Florida is, I haven't checked this, but it's, it sounds right to me. Someone said, if you go add up all the votes in Florida since 1992 in the presidential race, there's like a difference of 20,000 votes over all those years, right? So, and we saw two gov we saw a governor's race and a Senate race in Florida that were decided by uh, by razor thin, uh, thin margins the last time. So um, listen, if, this, uh, if these national numbers hold and Joe Biden's winning in states like Florida, I think we'll know something fairly decisive on election night. If this comes down to counting absentee and early ballots in Pennsylvania, it's gonna be a couple of weeks. Thank you. So let me go back to um, uh, the question which I said you would answer earlier, but I haven't asked you about, which is the, uh, the, the beer and cars. Um, are you still doing research on that and explain if you can uh people were surprised to learn that democrats don't drink more expensive beers um so yes i, I in a variety of ways i'm still doing research on beer and uh, uh beer and cars um and what what that what that comes from is uh it actually started with the george w bush campaign in 2004 and now things have become a lot more sophisticated where there's these big consumer surveys out there, which is how commercial advertisers decide where they're on what shows they're gonna advertise. So it asks people lots of questions about what sorts of television you watch, and then asks, 
what's your favorite toilet paper and kitty litter and beer and car. And so the advertisers know which shows to advertise on. So the George W. Bush campaign actually got these, these big commercial surveys and then the Obama did the same thing in 2008 to ask a couple political questions on there. So um, the real way it's used is you can see where high turnout Republicans, low turnout Democrats, high turnout Democrats, low turnout Republicans, whatever it is, what sorts of shows they watch. But then you can also do the fun thing and see, I always call it, you know, University of California faculty parking, right? That uh, if you look at people who, uh, people who drive a hybrid tend to skew high turnout and highly loyal to the Democratic Party. All right, another question. Um, people uh, feel free to send in more and don't be ashamed to ask these questions. Uh, can, can't, well, anyways, I won't say, maybe, maybe they're your students who you're afraid, because uh, if I didn't mention it, Ken does teach class for us. Um, what do you wish people would know about poll analysis that many people might not know? And I will add on sort of the, 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 the partner question, which is, and, and so what does the news media misreport about polls most regularly? That, that is another also really good good question. So I think, um, and whenever I teach students about waiting, um, I think they like it and I think it demystifies things, but it sounds, and I'll use a term my kids taught me a couple of years ago, it sounds sketchy, right? That you get the data back and then you are manipulating the data, weighting the data, changing the data because you think you have, um, uh, you, have, uh, you have the wrong number of men, women, white people, black people, people with a college education, people without a college education. And I think someone asked me before what I look at first, very few publicly available polls tell people what their demographics are and very few publicly available polls tell you um, how extensive their waiting was. But so, um, I mean, now people like to aggregate polls. Um, you know, a lot of people pull together five or six polls, real clear politics and places like that. Um, there are certain polls that always skew one way or another. Um, you know, a, a, a Donald Trump is always on the verge of winning elections if you look at the Rasmussen poll and less likely if you look at others. Um, is this because the pollsters are biased? Is it because they have just different techniques which consistently reward one side or the other? I cannot explain to you why Rasmussen finds what Rasmussen finds. Although it was closer last time than any of the others, correct? I yeah, mean, well, I think I think Rasmussen doesn't own Rasmussen anymore. Okay. Anyway, um, I, I, uh, and it helps if your dad founded ESPN and gave you a bunch of money to uh, start a polling firm. Um, <laughs> there are certain polls mostly that skew Republican that are released. I don't know if it's them particularly, so I don't know is the answer, that they're particularly putting their finger and saying, we, we wanna make this plus two if everyone else is say plus six, or they're making particular assumptions about the shape of the electorate that then have a differential impact. So maybe they think that there's gonna be much higher turnout among non-college educated whites than everyone else is seeing. And a consequence of that is their, their, their numbers will tend to be better for Republicans and better for President Trump. Um, and, um... And going back to your path to get here. So so I looked at your bio. That's why I knew about 1988 was the first year that you did this for a network. But you were just out of college. So did you know when you were a senior in college, like most of our students, that this was what you wanted to do professionally? Um, I was always interested in politics. And I was always a bit of a, a numbers nerd. But my quantitative training, statistical training, I mean, data visualization wasn't even a thing, right? Or if it was a thing, I hadn't heard about it, was so low compared to what probably most of our students have who are on the, who are on the presentation here or can, or, or can get. So 
I was someone interested in politics and was comfortable with numbers, but not necessarily a math whiz. And so my first job with, uh, with CBS in 87, which for the 87, 88 cycle was uh, back in the day before the internet where we had to get past vote data to build the models. And the way we got past vote data was fly to Little Rock, Arkansas, get a car and drive around the state visiting all the county clerk's offices and literally go in and get the big books and, uh, and write down the results, bring them back to New York, get those key, punch, key punched in. Obviously that world has changed, but um, that was my very first job in this uh, call and elections world. So uh, Andrea, who you mentioned earlier, uh, Andrea, you can, uh, you, can, you can elaborate on your question, make it, uh, but why don't we call it Andrea Wise. Hi, Ken. Hey, Andrea. <laughs> um, thanks for being with us. You bet. Uh, I don't know if I have a great elaboration, but just kind of curious about the Senate races. Anything interesting related to polling that you're seeing? Anything, anything we should be tracking? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so the last two weeks, which have not been a particularly super week for Republicans, super weeks for Republicans or President Trump. Uh, in the in in the polling, we've seen a bunch of races um, that many thought would not be competitive, like a South Carolina, like an Alaska that people thought the Republican would safely win, come into the competitive uh, can come into the competitive set. So, listen, I'm giving you a probabilistic assumption. I'm not I'm not saying that anything's definitely going to happen. Um, I'm a little skeptical that Democrats end up winning those sorts of, of races. I think we'll probably get a little bit of a, of a tightening over the last couple of weeks and those more safe Republican races are probably won by the, um, um, by the Republican. Um, that said, you know, we're also seeing seats, that, that said, Democrats can still take control over the Senate even if they don't win a South Carolina or an Alaska. Um, but Democrats are looking very strong in places like Maine and Colorado, um, Iowa, North Carolina, those Georgia seats even. Um, and one thing that I'm really paying attention to and uh, well, it's gonna matter one way or the other is the fact that the Republican Senate candidate in some of these races like a Jody Ernst in Iowa or a Martha McSally in in Arizona, and that's another race which is trending strongly for the Democrats, Mark Kelly. The uh, President Trump's actually running ahead of the Republican Senate candidates. Uh, and if you think President Trump is unpopular and a drag on Republicans, um, uh, which most of us think, what's odd about that is he's running ahead of Republican Senate candidates in some of these states, which may mean that there's some voters out there that are just Trump voters, and maybe they end up not voting the Senate, the Senate race. Or what I expect to happen is those votes will end up lining up. I remember looking at Wisconsin for the last couple of elections, and you look precinct by precinct and vote for governor, vote for Senate in a midterm election, or vote for president, vote for Senate, precinct by precinct almost match exactly. People don't, people don't split their their ballots. So I expect to see those, those line up. If they line up downward, meaning the, that Trump only does as well as the Senate candidates, that means Joe Biden does better in some of those states than, than most people expect. Um, and if those Republican Senate candidates end up meeting Donald Trump's number in that state, it means some of those races like, like uh, uh, Iowa, North Carolina, even Arizona, that the Republican candidates a lot more competitive there. So you, I mean, I, um, I follow politics very, very closely and I am up on the big picture, I think very well. You have to follow the tiny minute picture. And I know that you have a background. You got your PhD at University of Michigan, which is why we talk about Michigan football and why you know that state well. You uh, taught at Wisconsin, fine, you understand that. 
But I mean, do you, if I were to just throw out, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. I'm just curious about this. I mean, you could explain like the different precincts uh, and what, I mean, all the, I mean, in, in Phoenix, Arizona or in uh, Charlotte, in, I mean, uh, this is something that you know or you have to run to the computer to look up? Yeah, a little bit of both. So it's not like completely Rain Man that I can tell you about the second district in this, you know, this place in, in Scottsdale. But uh, as we lead up to the election, I'm trying to get smart about, really smart about seven or eight states. Um, and it's a little bit of, it's, it's not so much that precinct level of granularity. It has a lot more now to do with how they're counting their votes, when they're counting their votes, what percent of the votes are early, what percent of the votes are gonna be election day. So what are those, uh, or, or I'm not sure that, that, that that's the right question. If, um, I mean, are there seven or eight states that you think decide this election? If so, what are those states? Some are obvious, some might not be. Yeah, no, I think they're all obvious, right? So it's, uh, it's the, uh, what was the blue wall? Um, so it's, um, it's, uh, it's Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida really are the key, um, the key battlegrounds uh, that, we're, that we're looking at. And then you expand that you know, a little bit more to some other states. But most of those other states would be um, uh, like granite countertops, nice to have, but you don't need to have them. So uh, can Biden win the presidency without winning Ohio? Yes. Can Biden win the presidency without winning Iowa? Yes. Um, but uh, will tend to pay more attention to those states, like in Iowa, for example, uh, because it's getting a little bit closer in the presidential race and it's got such an important Senate race. Are there, um, are, are there states that Trump, are, uh, are there states that Clinton won that Trump potentially could win this time? So there was a bunch of talk about Minnesota um, and, uh, and, and mostly the talk about Minnesota was that it could be a lot more competitive for Trump because there's a lot of non-college educated whites in Minnesota. Everyone thinks of Minnesota as Hubert Humphrey and this big and this big liberal state. And oh my gosh, Minnesota's probably gone for the Democrat in every year since I don't know. Did did, did Ronald Reagan win it in uh, win it in uh, win it in eighty? Walter Mondale, Walter Mondale won, won Minnesota. Or but we're going. Well, I mean, probably oh, the he state didn't win in uh, eighty. No. I don't think, well, who knows? I will look it up. Probably the state, probably the state the Democrats have won for the longest time, right? But it has a very large proportion of the electorate that's non-college educated whites. Um, so that race was a lot closer than people thought it would be in 2016, but does not appear like it's gonna be, uh, gonna be in play in this, in, this, uh, in this year. The answer for your trivia buffs is George McGovern is the last Democrat to have lost Minnesota. So yeah. that's 1972. That's a rather remarkable streak. Uh, yeah. We have somebody who wants to know that uh, you mentioned the Senate race in Iowa. How do you do this? I mean, the sample sizes are so much smaller in states. Uh, can you discuss how you do predict down ballot results? Well, I mean, the, it's, it's not really sample sizes so much for how we're calling races. Sample sizes, um, there will be an exit poll with sample sizes and that will mostly be used in the analysis of the race. Uh, but when it comes down to calling the races, we're looking, at, we're, looking at, we're looking at vote data and statistical models off the vote data. And we're looking at the same precincts for president as we are for Senate. Um, all right, so here's a, a different question, a different sort of question. What would you like to ask poll respondents that you can't ask for whatever reason, ethical, legal, Wow. That's a question I'm guessing you've never been asked. So like, like as those of you who've taken my class, it, you know, a lot of professors will say there's no such thing as a stupid question, but in fact, there are lots of them. But like every question here has been awesome. And I've never been asked that question. And that is a great question. Um, okay, that's I, I have to think you. about that. But that is that you 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 stump the pollster, which is why I don't like answering questions. I like I like asking questions. But yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I guess the answer would be um, maybe some sort of I mean, truth serum would be the would be would be one answer. But um, 
you can ask about people's certainty, but to get a real measure of people's certainty for what they're answering. Oh, you know how, you know how I'd answer this? That um, I'm a big believer in putting don't knows in questions. Because if you ask someone a question, they'll answer the question even if they don't know. And so uh, I think it's important to give people the chance to say they, they, um, they don't know. Um, so it would be giving people some sort of truth serum that if they actually didn't know, they would tell you they didn't know. All right, and where, how do you feel on the, uh, on the fight over when to release results? Um, you know, in terms of, I mean, in, in France, exit polls aren't allowed to be used for project. They can't announce until all the voting is counted in other places. Uh, and, and famously in 1980, Jimmy Carter conceded the presidential election before California polls had closed. Um, as somebody in the middle of the process, basically why, how do you feel about that? And, and, and I guess I say already defensively, why should you know things that, that the rest of the public doesn't? Well, that's why we should release it as soon as we know. So you just answered your own question. Um, that's how I feel. Do you agree with that's what you would say? Yeah, so I'll ask a couple things, just as a, you know, as a point of fact, we don't release results until the polls closed in particular states, right? So we're not characterizing it in, in the afternoon. Um, we're, we're releasing results in, uh, in particular states. Everyone makes a big deal about that Jimmy Carter thing, but like Jimmy, Car Jimmy Carter had a temper tantrum and was annoyed that he lost to Ronald Reagan, so wanted to go out and concede so he could go home and go to sleep. We didn't make him concede. I mean, I was 15, so I wasn't making anyone do anything at the time. But um, uh, so, you know, we call the races when we have the information um, after, after, the, after the polls have closed. There was a bit of a, bit of a kerfuffle. Wait, but wait, let me just push on that for a second. Why, then why bother to wait till the polls are closed? Why, why not announce as soon as you have enough information in Florida, the panhandle still voting or other, you know, other votes aren't all counted and the polls haven't closed. Why not go ahead and announce it then? Because I think there's a difference between um, announcing that something has happened versus polling. So people are polling up till the day before the election. Some people are even talking about polls on the day of the election. They're making polling assessments or probability assessments of who's going to win. Um, many countries outlaw that, right? You can't talk about polls within 72 hours of a uh, of, um, of election day. And I actually think France is one of those countries that bans both the, the release of polls um, be, be a couple of days before an, uh, an election. But I think when you're actually saying what has happened, you should wait until that has happened to say that. And there's a difference between, there's a difference between me, I could take you through my assessments of every state, what I think is gonna happen given previous polling information, current polling information, my insights, my knowledge of the state, that's very different than me on election night saying so-and-so has won a state. But, okay, okay. Um, so we've got another question. All right, so people are camera shy, that's fine. But anybody who wants to ask a question, please. We have uh, another five minutes left to go. Somebody wants to know as an aspiring researcher, I wanna know what advice do you have for those of us planning to conduct polls and surveys? So I don't know what your major is. I don't know what, 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 what institution you are, you are at. You certainly don't need to be a statistics major and take 20 classes in polling, but to the extent you can take a basic research design class, a basic stats class, a basic data visualization class. And if you can take a class on polling or survey research, um, actually just the way things work out, lots of classes on survey research tend to be based out of sociology departments rather than, rather than political science departments, but you get excellent training in all of those. Uh, and then um, try and do some sort of applied internship. And listen, like I said at the start, who knows, I might've had you in a class this, uh, this uh, this uh, this semester, or gotten gotten to know folks who come by my come by my office. But if anyone uh, anyone on this anyone on this call is uh, interested in talking about possible opportunities, I have ten people a week emailing me asking me if I have recommendations for junior level people with a little bit of math and statistical aptitude who are interested in going into the survey research world. That is a growth industry.
So give me a shout. How much math do you have? I'm just curious, what's your highest math? I mean, what, what math? Yeah, what's... So I then went on to get a PhD in Michigan, which is a little bit more quantitative. So um, I had, so I took a lot of statistics classes, but um, in terms of just old regular math, um, you know, I took Calc 1 three times, right? I took it in high school. I took it in- Because you uh, loved it so much or because you didn't do so well the first couple of times? Uh, in high school, because I, because I, I think I wanted to. In college, because I thought I would do well in it, because I'd already taken it. That wasn't necessarily correct. And then when I was in graduate school, um, before I started graduate school, just to hone up on on calc, which is which is which is a very crucial crucial skill. So, um, okay. you know, listen, am I doing calc? I can't remember the last time I actually did calc, right? Where I'm looking at, you know, I'm you know, uh, taking the integral of something, but um, it's uh, it's uh, certainly an important skill as you go into any sort of advanced statistics, but it's very applied sorts of things. Uh, and um, maybe not maybe not in the next two weeks before the election because I might be a little bit busy. But please, if folks are interested in talking, reach out to Mark. Mark, feel free to give him, give folks my email. I think my email is on the UCBC website anyway. So feel Great. free to be in touch. All right. So we got time for one more question. Somebody who actually is uh, Caleb. Caleb, somebody who will show their face, which is good. There you are. Uh, hi, Professor Goldstein. Thanks so much for coming and talking to us. You bet. Um, so my question was, uh, do you think that polls have an impact on the way people actually vote? Uh, and if so, do you worry that the proliferation of polling data leads people to focus more on horse races um, than on actual issues? Another super question. Really, really good question. Um, the evidence on that is pretty is is is, is pretty mixed uh, on the effect of polling. The evidence of these models, which we didn't talk about very much, so people look at five thirty eight or Nate Cohen or the the Economist that says that so and so has a eighty two percent chance of winning or a ninety one percent chance of winning. There is evidence that people overestimate or underestimate the model, right? So. If you hear 55% chance of winning, you immediately move that to 100% chance of winning. If you uh, hear someone's got only a 40% chance of winning because it's under 50, you immediately move that to a 0% chance of, of winning. So, um, and the polls feed many of those, many of those uh, models. Um, but listen, when you have a race that was decided by so close a margin as 2016, there's lots of, there's lots of possible culprits. Um, but I do think it's plausible when people look at the New York Times, which still at 10 o'clock on election night at Hillary Clinton with a 92% chance of winning, that that could decrease people's um, uh, uh, likelihood of turning out. But that's a great, if, you, uh, if you're still looking for a senior thesis or looking to do something in graduate school, that is a great topic to study. All right. And uh, we're... We have time for this is a very straightforward question, although I always laugh at these questions. Uh, what's what state or race do you think will be the biggest surprise this November? Which, of course, was obvious. I guess it wouldn't be a surprise. So so what place are you looking? Is there any place that you think that the conventional wisdom is most wrong in this election? I'll put it that way. God, seconds from a clean getaway. That's another good one. Um, There's a possibility that we could have some more decisive margins than we think. Okay. Um, and I can only interpret that in one way, which is you think the election might not be as close as you think, which this is what the media does. So talking to a pollster, Ken Goldstein, maybe Biden wins by even more, but you didn't say that, but that's the way that the media would extrapolate that. That's all I'm telling you. Um, and you are in, thank you very much. You are in, just because students, I, I hate to do this. You're actually in the UC Center right now. Nope, right? I'm, in my, I'm in my house right now. Oh, sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> so okay. I mean, you can see like in my, in my office, for those of you, none of you remember, but that's like the second generation Apple computer up there, which I wrote my dissertation on, which I just found in the garage. That's a Mac SE for all of you. 
kids. Very out nice. Maybe that's what I thought. I thought equipment that old must be in a UC facility, but okay. Um, thank you, Ken. Um, it's going to be a busy couple of weeks. Uh, thank you to everybody for attending. Remember Friday, we have Tim Uecki, who is the head of, infect of, of influenza at the CDC talking about COVID. And next Wednesday, Madeleine Albright, who uh, was President Clinton's Secretary of State. Uh, Thanks a lot. See you later. Hold on, everybody.